Hi there, this is uh, Jim Serrier. I gave this presentation, Bible Mysteries Revealed, on August 12th, Sunday, in Andover, and a few people have asked me to do it again and to publish it, so that's what I'm doing today. The reason for me giving this presentation was really to unlock some Bible mysteries for you, to introduce you to the whole Bible and introduce prophecies fulfilled and unfulfilled, which really reinforce how true the Bible is. And I'll show you that it's a living document today. And then the last thing, my last goal was to interest you in, in reading the Bible and establishing a relationship with Jesus. So I'm going to cover some core Christian beliefs just so we get that out of the way that, you know, the Christians believe pretty much the, um, the same thing. Some interpret it slightly differently. Um, and I'll talk about that just a little bit. And then our world that we're living in today. I want to cover the land of Israel. I've been to Israel twice. I'll show you a few photographs so you can put in perspective where some of these things occur that are in the Bible. Uh, to talk a little bit about the Bible being an integrated messaging system. And most importantly, to tell you about the beginning of the Bible in the days of Noah. As we jump to the end of the Bible and Jesus tells us it will be as it was in the days of Noah upon his coming back a second time, you really need to understand to look for the signs of what occurred in the beginning. We'll talk about the birth of Israel and the regathering of Israel. These are major prophetic events in the Bible that have already occurred. And the first coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and what foretold uh, signs are there of his second coming. And then finally, how do I enter heaven? So assume you're going to take a trip. Everybody goes on vacation. Most people will study the destination choices and choose one and then study the ways to get th to their destination. And then they stick to the schedule and the route. However, most of the people I talk to who haven't read the Bible or have only read parts of the Bible and don't know the Bible. And this is one of the most important um, destinations of your eternal life that you're ever going to take. So it describes the destination and the route of how you get there. So it's really important that people, um, you know, read the Bible. Uh, without a plan, you're most likely to end up in the wrong place, and that's a really bad place. So before we get started, I just want to lay this down and suggest to you that there's a principle which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all argument, and which cannot fail to keep man in everlasting ignorance. And that, that is, the principle is condemnation before investigation. So before you condemn my talk or turn off, just listen, investigate yourself to see if these things are true, because they are. Core Christian beliefs. The first belief is that Jesus Christ is the only way to eternal salvation with God the Father. And Jesus tells us that in John 3. He also tells us in John 14, 6. We are saved by grace through faith not by works. So many people think, well, I'm a good person, I live a good life, and I do good things. Surely God will have mercy on me, and I will get into heaven for that. But that's not true. The only way to heaven is through the Son. And you must accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and declare that verbally before you can get into heaven. The works that you do on this earth will also determine how what your rewards are in heaven, but you can't work your way into heaven. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's what Christians believe. He came as a man. He was the incarnation of a man, appeared on earth in that form. He was resurrected from the grave and ascended into heaven. Christians believe that there is a doctrine of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that the Holy Bible is the inspired and infallible Word of God. And when you read the Bible and you see how integrated it is, written by 40 authors over 1,000 to 1,500 years, you really understand that it's almost impossible for this to all be so coordinated that it ties together the way it does without having been the inspired and infallible Word of God. We believe that we are baptized with the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. And we're regenerated by the Holy Spirit. And we believe in the doctrine of heaven and hell, that hell does exist. We believe that the second coming of Jesus Christ will come back to, the, to our, our earth. 
and uh, rule for a millennium. Here's, a, here's the first little mystery I wanted to point out to you. This is uh, the mystery of the Trinity. And what's amazing about this is that a lady named uh, Terry uh, Cullen, no, Tawny Cullen, wrote a book called Josiah's Fire. This is about her autistic son who could not, he was a very severe case of autism, could not read, write, talk, could not spell. And at age seven, uh, they had gotten him an iPad with the alphabets on the screen so she could try to begin to teach him how to, you know, write words like cat, hat. And while she's sitting on the bed with him one afternoon, he started tapping out this, a message. And it said, the triune God, the Father is the manager, the Son is the lover of operations, the Holy Spirit is the worker. So it is the three-in-one getting things done. The world was created by three functions. It went like this. Father thought it, Son loved it, and Holy Spirit carried out the plan. That is how the Trinity works. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit lack nothing, and they all talk together about how things should go. Life is simple if you know he is Papa, he is Healer, he is Helper. Man must voice, Father, what do you think? Jesus, what do you love? Spirit, how should we do, what, would you, what should we do about it? This is your mission. Do what the Father thinks, what Jesus loves, and what the Spirit tells. That is really the simplest definition of the Trinity that I've ever come across. It's a great book. I suggest you read it because uh, Josiah also documents his many trips to heaven with Jesus, with God, his uh, angel friend, Raphael, who uh, led him through all these experiences. And it's a real faith builder that you know that heaven really does exist. And God is speaking through this seven-year-old autistic child. So let's, let's go back to the Bible and some of the basics. I, uh, this is a, a slide that was done by Ken Johnson in a great book that he just came out with called Ancient Prophecies Revealed. And he talks about, uh, just to show you, the Old Testament is really about the birth of Israel and Israel's ups and downs during, uh, during its time. Um, the Jews um, used this book, the Old Testament, they talk, called the uh, Tanakh. And um, it's documented here that uh, uh, Israel is formed as a nation. It uh, is punished several times for falling away from and worshiping false gods. It's overthrown by the Babylonians who tear down the first temple. Uh, the, Babylonia, the, the Israelis are in captivity in Babylonia for 70 years. Uh, they come back to their land. Uh, they're freed by the Persians who overthrew the Babylonians. They come back to their land. They build the second temple. Um, they are uh, conquered by the Greeks and then the Romans, um, and then they are dis, uh, dispersed throughout the, throughout the world uh, later on. Uh, the New Testament covers uh, Jesus Christ's birth and childhood and ministry, his death and resurrection, and also um, the, uh, the apostles going out into the world and, and spreading the uh, the news of Jesus Christ, our Savior. In the um, down below, you'll see these these uh, time periods: Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These represent the seven churches of Asia Minor, and in the uh, Book of Revelation, in chapter two and three, Jesus Christ wrote letters through John, who was uh, one of the last living uh, disciples who had been exiled to the island of Patmos off the coast of Ephesus, Turkey. And um, he wrote the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. And Jesus describes these seven churches, what they're doing correctly and what they're doing incorrectly, what they're doing wrong. And, his, and the church that was doing it all perfectly right was the church of Philadelphia. And the church of Laodicea was the lukewarm church who had lost its, its love and um, Jesus said that I prefer you to be cold or I prefer you to be hot but not lukewarm. 
because I will spit you out of my mouth like lukewarm water. Uh, during the, this time um, that Christ is on earth, um, the first crossover period where the Jews that converted to Christian, Christianity, they were Messianic Jews, and those that did not uh, were punished in 70 AD when they were dispersed to the four corners of the, of the earth. And uh, the treasures of Jerusalem and many Jews were taken prisoner by the Romans back to Rome to build the Colosseum. This is celebrated by the Arch of Titus that stands today in Rome. And you can see the, the Roman soldiers marching back in victory from Jerusalem to Rome carrying a menorah over their shoulder. Uh, in 1948, the, Israel, the nation of Israel was reformed. And all the uh, and the Jews were gathered from the four corners of the earth. Um, after this, there's a second crossover period that we're living today, where Jews are coming to recognize that Christ came the first time, and they're becoming Christians or Messianic Jews. At the end of the Church Age, which we're rapidly approaching, based on all the signs in the Bible, the born again Christians will be raptured or taken up into heaven. For the marriage supper of the Lamb, this is the wedding supper, and then they will return with Jesus at his second coming to overthrow Satan and his minions and cast them into the abyss for a, forever. Uh, prior to that, there's a seven years of tribulation that will occur where the earth is ruled by the Antichrist, and that will be a very unpleasant time for people to, to go through. Some people will uh, come to Jesus during that time and uh, will be persecuted greatly and, um, and then will we'll join the, uh, the saints in heaven. And then finally, after Christ's coming, the new Jerusalem will descend to the, over the existing Jerusalem and uh, Jesus Christ will rule for millennia uh, on earth as it is in heaven. So that's a quick synopsis of the Bible. So let me talk about the world we live in today, which is very interesting, to say the least. Um, there's a study that was done showing that 64% of Americans agreed strongly or somewhat that all religions worship the same God. This is called polytheism as opposed to monotheism, which is practiced in Christianity, that we worship one and only God. So if this were true, what a cruel joke God played on Jesus by putting him on the cross for nothing if we all worship the same God. But that's what 64% of the Americans believe. 60% of Americans agreed that heaven is a place where all people will be reunited with their loved ones. And, and that's just not biblical. It's just not true. 60% disagree that hell is an eternal place of, of judgment where God sends people who do not trust in Jesus Christ. And then 51% of those surveyed believe that abortion is not a sin. This was done by a study of the State of America Theology study in 2016. Now, Jonathan Kahn, who uh, has written uh, two or three New York Times bestsellers, one being uh, The Harbinger, another one being The Mystery of the Shemitah, and his most recent one is uh, The Paradigm. Jonathan explores the, the concept that history repeats itself in the Bible and in modern times today. And he shows examples of that occurring. Uh, that happened on 9-11 in the United States when our Twin Towers were taken down by the Jets. It fulfilled uh, some uh, prophecy that occurred in Isaiah 9-10 uh, where the Israelis had turned away from God and uh, God was punishing them, so he lowered the a barrier of protection which allowed the Assyrians to come in and conquer the ten northern tribes of Israel. This occurred, this paradigm, this archetype, this pattern occurred exactly uh, on 9-11 in the United States and if you read this book The Harbinger you, you would just you would be able to understand that. Um, he talks about another paradigm that occurred in the, and during the time of Ahab, King Ahab of Israel and his wife Jezebel, it mirrors another president and first lady in the United States to the T. Um, he describes what Israel was going through uh, during those days of the apostasy where they turned away from God. 
I, and the identical thing is happening in our culture today. So Western civilizations today are following this archetype, this pattern, um, and uh, it's in a time when, when they had uh, originally been founded for the will and purposes of God. Uh, America was first uh, settled by the Puritans uh, when George Washington was inaugurated president in New York City on Wall Street. He went down to the Christ Church, which stands there today, got on his knees and dedicated this country to God. <clears throat> so this falling away was represented by worshiping idols uh, and uh, offering child sacrifices. This was practiced during uh, King Ahab and Jezebel's time. Um, and those idols could today be sports figures or material possessions or money or celebrities. Uh, there was there was a descent into materialism, carnality, and sensuality. I call this humanism, which is occurring in our society today. And um, who now create their who now this create their own gods, turning away from absolute truth and embrace of subjectivity. If they could create their own truth, then they could uh, be no more absolute truth, and that's called relativism. Thus, they could now overrule the Word of God and create new laws to nullify the laws of God and a new morality to nullify the standards they once viewed as immutable. And that's happened to us. We've now legalized abortion. We've legalized homosexual marriage. They begin driving God from the public square, out of, out of their government, out of in the instruction of their children, out of their culture, and out of their lives. They expunged His words from the public discourse and His law, from their collective consciousness. In doing so, they created a vacuum, and into that vacuum they brought in more gods. Their civilization was now at war against the foundations on which it stood. What the nations had once opposed and shunned, it had now become. So the metamorphosis was complete. And that's happened in America and the Western civilization today. So, we are living today as it was in the days of Noah, and as I go forth in this presentation, I'm going to show you that. Just to lay down some markers for what I, what I mean by uh, we're living in the days of, as it was in the days of Noah. We are crossbreeding through genetic engineering of plants, animals, and humans. Um, during the time at the beginning of the Bible, uh, it referred there was a there was a, an incursion by the fall, the fallen uh, angels uh, that um, experimented with uh, 200 sets of animals, slightly different chromosome counts, and they crossbred those uh, genetically unstable life forms to create whole new species. And this is uh, covered in uh, the Book of the Giants, the Book of Enoch, from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Today in England in 2008, Human Fertilization Embryology Act was passed allowing researchers to create uh, human-animal hybrid embryos as long as they were destroyed after 14 days. And over 150 hybrid embryos have been created, both cybrids, that's human nuclei, and uh, implanted into an animal cell, and chimeras, which are animal nuclei, implanted into a human cell. There's this race uh, in the military today uh, to achieve something called singularity. Um, this is right out of the science fiction movie, The Terminator. And that is uh, technological singularity is the hypothesis that the invention of artificial superintelligence will abruptly trigger runaway technological growth, resulting in unfathomable changes to human civilization. So we are the uh, military in all the major countries like Russia, China, the United States, are experimenting with uh, implanting uh, microchips, uh, computers into soldiers' brains. Instead of giving them 120 IQ, we'd give them 10,000 IQ as an example. Also, the invention of robots. Robots, uh, from a singularity standpoint, would think for themselves and evolve and not require human intervention. And then, of course, uh, today we're, we see humanism, sensuality, carnality, materialism, the rule of the day. Worshiping of false idols is occurring today. 
and human sacrifices are occurring today. We've killed 60 million babies since 1972, I think it is, Roe v. Roe v. Wade was, was ruled on by the Supreme Court. And this is to our God of self-pleasures that offers the convenience of not having to deal with pregnancy. So the warning is, woe, Isaiah 5.20 says, this is in the Old Testament, uh, around uh, 7th century B.C., says, woe to those who call evil good and who call good evil. So for, for many of us, we see the world today as being upside down. Things that were, were used to be evil are uh, now called good. And things that used to be good are now called evil, such as the church. The church is viewed as evil. Homosexuality is viewed as good. Um, and then Hosea 4, 6 in the Old Testament says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee. So let me move into the land of the Bible and just show you uh, a little bit about, tell you a, bit, a little bit about Israel uh, to set the stage for the biblical discussions we're going to have going forward. Um, I've been to Israel twice. Uh, you, you can see at the very top of this uh, picture, photo of Israel is the Golan Heights. That's the disputed territory between Syria and Israel. Currently Israel occupies that, that area. It's a mountainous terrain and it's a great vantage point to look down into Syria. From that point it's only 40 miles to Damascus. The tallest mountain in Israel is Mount Hermon which is now 9,000 feet tall. It sits right at that tri-corner area of Syria and Lebanon and Israel. At the bottom of that mountain is a big cave, and it's called the Gates of Hell. And there was a city there called Caesarea Philippi, and the ruins are there today. Uh, you see the Sea of Galilee, uh, this blue lake uh, next to Tiberias. This is the area of Nazareth where Jesus uh, was, uh, was performing his ministry, began his ministry. And uh, from Mount Hermon down to the Sea of Galilee, uh, those are, Mount Hermon is the headwaters for the Jordan River. It flows into the Sea of Galilee and then flows out down south to the Dead Sea, which is the most salinic body of water, I believe, on the planet. And it's also the lowest point uh, measured in sea level or below sea level on the planet. This area in the light brown is the West Bank. It's west of the Jordan River. That's the reason they call it the West Bank. And that's the area that is currently um, uh, overseen by Israel, but Palestinian authority uh, rules in that area. Uh, you'll see Jerusalem, and then below that is Bethlehem. Bethlehem is six miles south of Jerusalem. And uh, the yellow portion up along the coast from Haifa down to Tel Aviv this area was the thinnest strip of is the Israeli country when it was re, uh, regathered in uh, May 27, 1948. Uh, down south of Bethlehem is Hebron. That's the uh, place where the patriarchs are buried. And then uh, down here by the Dead Sea is Masada and the Qumran Caves where the Dead Sea Squirrels were found in 1947. And then one of the areas we hear a lot about is Gaza. Uh, you'll see Gaza is along the coast. It's uh, currently uh, land that was given back to the Palestinians and uh, currently fires a lot of rockets from there into Israel, as well as up north out of Lebanon along the Israeli border. Hezbollah fires rockets into Israel from that point as well. This is uh, Jerusalem. And I, when I took this photograph, I was standing on the Mount of Olives at the bottom of the photograph. You see that there's a lot of um, graves there, and those are all Jewish uh, cemetery. They know that Jesus is going to um, return to the Mount of Olives, and they want to be the first to be resurrected. So that's the reason they tore down the, took down the olive trees and built a giant cemetery, cemetery there. Down below that is one of the three valleys that defines the city of Jerusalem. Uh, it's, this one is the Kidron Valley. And then looking up in the middle of the photograph, you'll see the Temple Mount. 
and the eastern gate of the Temple Mount. You see how the bricks have sealed up there. Uh, it's closed up, that eastern gate that led up to the Temple Mount. And there's a Muslim cemetery in front of it. And they realize, the Muslims realize that Jews can't defile themselves with dead bodies. So they figure if Jesus does come back, he has to walk through a Muslim cemetery and he won't be able to get in through since the gates are blocked up. And then the Dome of the Rock is a Muslim mosque that's built on top of Mount Moriah. This is where the, the Temple Mount used to reside. This is the most disputed territory in the world. And then, of course, the Temple Mount, you can see the long walls that extend there. So on this Mount of Olives in the New Testament, in the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, Jesus gives us the Olivet Discourse. And this is really important. It's, it's five slides long, so I'm going to ask that you bear with me as I go through this, because it's one of the most important passages given to us by Jesus. It tells us what's going to, what are the signs of his second coming. So it says that as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, tell us what will happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And when he's referring to the end of the age, we refer to that as the end of the church age today. Um, he says, watch out that no one deceives you for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. A nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. No one, will, no one who stands firm to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom uh, will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Just to comment on this particular slide is that we've had wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes in various places since the beginning of time. But the thing that makes it different, as you'll learn as we go through this, is one very key thing has to happen, and that is Israel has to be reformed as a nation, and Jerusalem has to be the capital of Israel, because that's the holy place. And you'll find in a few minutes that when the abomination that causes desolation, this is the Antichrist, stands in the holy place, then the end is near. And the, the gospel is being preached today throughout all the nations through our technology of the internet and iPhones and missionaries. So he goes on to say that when you see that standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet, of, prophet Daniel, which is documented in the Old Bible in the book of Daniel, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the house stop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for the pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the, on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. What he's describing there is the Great Tribulation, the last three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation, which is also documented in great detail in the last book, the book of Revelations. He said, If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. And what he's talking about here is the elect is are the born-again Christians in the church that will be taken up into heaven and will not have to go through the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, even to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See that I have, uh, see, I have told ahead of time. So if anyone tells you, there he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For his lightning comes from the east 
is visible even in the West, so it will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there will be vultures gather. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not, not give light and the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. He's describing this great wrath that pours out in the book of, Tribu uh, book of Revelation during the, at the end of the Great Tribulation. Um, then he and he goes on to say, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples on earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And the reason he says that is because he he realizes that um, the people who don't believe in Jesus Christ are then going to recognize that this is all true, and due to all their sinful ways, they know what's coming, and they're really afraid when they see this happening. It goes on to say, and he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Then this is very important. He says, now learn the lesson from the fig tree. Jeremiah describes the fig tree as Israel. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near right at the door. Truly, I tell you this, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. This is very interesting because um, many of us believe that when Israel was reformed as a nation in one day, in May 27, 1948, in the United Nations, that was a key marker for the beginning of this time period of this generation that will see the second coming of Jesus Christ. Um, next slide. Next to the last slide. It says, uh, But about the day or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So in a minute, we're going to, we're going to investigate what it was like in the days of Noah so we can compare what's happening in those days to what's happening today. Jesus goes on to say, For in those days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. That passage is describing the rapture where he takes the elect of the church up into heaven for the wedding supper with Jesus Christ prior to his coming back to judge everyone. He goes on to say that therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. When he's talking about giving his servants food, this is a parable for giving non-believers and believers um, the word of God and feeding their souls and their spirits. He goes on to say, but suppose that that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day he does not expect him, and at an hour he was not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So let me uh, just, this is the Temple Mount, uh, the Islamic Temple Mount on the Dome of the Rock on Mount Moriah. This mountain was the mountain where uh, God had ordered Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, but then uh, was testing his, his loyalty to God. And then um, he um, offered um, 
Abraham a lamb, the lamb of God, to sacrifice instead for atonement of sins. The Muslims uh, believe that uh, Muhammad ascended into heaven um, in the uh, 7th century, around 650 uh, A.D., from this rock as well. That's what makes it such a contested spot. Now, this is one of the first little pieces of uh, prophecy I want to share with you. Um, Ezekiel 40 through 48 describes the future millennial temple in great detail. And although the, the second temple was destroyed, the Jews are planning on building a third temple today. They've got it all planned out. It's being organ, or, organized through the Temple Institute in Jerusalem. Um, the outer structure, including the western wall and the eastern gate, has remained since, uh, since the time that the second temple on top was torn down. So Ezekiel writes that some, sometime between the millennial temple at the end of the church age is built, uh, the eastern gate would be sealed up because the glory of the Lord, the Messiah, had entered through it. And this refers to the triumphal entry of, of Jesus in uh, A.D. 32. So this, this Temple Mount gate fulfilled prophecy, the sealing of it, by a, um, a Muslim sealed up this gate in 1517 A.D. And this fulfilled prophecy that Ezekiel 40 through 48 was talking about. Now this is the Garden of Gethsemane. This is uh, where Jesus was <clears throat> the night before he was taken to be flogged and then crucified. And I wanted to share with you what happened in that garden that evening before he was taken. He, he was uh, approached by Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee. Uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees made up the uh, Sanhedrin of the Jewish um, uh, ruling class. And um, he was a member of the council. And he came and said, Rabbi, teacher, asking him, how can I see the kingdom of God? Because he was one of the few Pharisees that believed Jesus was who he said he was. So Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom, kingdom of God unless they are born again. And this is where that term comes from about born-again Christians. Nicodemus responded, Surely they cannot enter a second time in their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of heaven kingdom of God, unless they are born of, wa of the water, water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound. But, no, you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Very, uh, very important uh, uh, teaching from Jesus there. This is just a quick uh, photograph that I took of the the model. Uh, there's a uh, museum that shows the first and second temple period of, of, uh, of Jerusalem. And in the center of the photograph is what the actual temple, first and second, second temple look like. This is a picture taken in 1917 by uh, General Gordon from the British Army of where he thought Jesus had been crucified on the hill, the hill of the skull. You see uh, a couple of eyes there that look like uh, a skull. And this is what that photo looks like today. This is a picture of my wife and myself in front of the garden tomb where Jesus, we thought that Jesus was laid uh, after he had been crucified. And then down south, on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see the picture of the Dead Sea. And on the left, you see Masada. Masada was a plateaued mountain that King Herod the Great had built a beautiful little palace for himself down uh, on top of that mountain. And uh, during the Jewish wars that was documented by the first century Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, um, he describes the, um, how the Jews, the last remnants of the Jews fighting the Romans, had taken that mountain and prevented the Romans from coming up and getting them. And the Romans camped out around that mountain for a long time, cut off their water supply. And on the right-hand side of that photograph, you'll see a little set of rocks that's formed in a square in the lower right-hand corner. 
That's a Roman square, and there are several of those still existing today around the mountain showing how they laid siege to Masada, trying to get at the remaining Jews that were opposing them in 70 A.D. This is the siege ramp that the Romans constructed to get up to the top of the mountain. And by the time the Romans got up there, all the Jews had committed suicide except for a couple that, were, that came back and, uh, and uh, told uh, Flavius Josephus what had happened. So going back to this photograph, I'm going to show you a picture of the Sea of Galilee and Tiberias. That's the Sea of Galilee and Tiberias in the background. So now we're going to talk about the Bible and, and is it true? So there's two worldviews today. One is everything is a result of a cosmic accident. In other words, out of nothing and no energy, the Big Bang occurred, and all the all the uh, the universe was created accidentally, and we were created accidentally on this perfect Earth with everything that we need. The other view is that we are the result of a deliberate design by a designer. Um, the Bible, there's, there's two Bibles that Christians uh, mostly follow. There's the Protestant Bible and the Catholic Bible. I didn't put the Mormon Bible up here or the Greek Orthodox Bible or the Ethiopian Orthodox Bible. But in the United States, these are the two primary books. And the difference between them is six, six books more in the Catholic Bible in the Old Testament than in the New Test than in the Protestant Bible. The Protestant Bible, or the Bible, I should say, was was constructed by about forty authors over over about fifteen hundred year period. And this is a very interesting saying. It's very true that the Old Testament is the New Testament revealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament concealed. And that's one of the reasons we refer to it as an integrated messaging system and that it really has to be the infallible um, hand of God on this, this writing because of the way it's written and, and integrated together. And every time we read it, we continue to learn uh, so many things that uh, God tells us in this book. <clears throat> the Old Testament is, a, is an account of a, na of, of a nation, Israel, and the New Testament is about a man named Jesus Christ. Um, this Perry Stone put this out. I thought it was kind of interesting. It's, it talks about in the beginning of the, the first book, Genesis. There was paradise in the Garden of Eden. God walked with man. There was access to the tree of life. There was no sin. There's no sickness or death. And Adam's first bride was Eve. In the end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, there is paradise again. God will be with man. We will have access to the tree of life. There will be no sin no sickness or death, and Jesus, second Adam's bride, will be the church, the remnant. And the reason they call it the remnant is not everyone in the church is going to make it to heaven uh, because there's, there's sin in all the churches, um, just like there's great goodness in all the churches. <clears throat> so the first five books of the, the Bible is the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, or... Um, and uh, the Jews call it the Torah, the first five books. The book of Genesis is about the, the beginnings. Exodus is about the birth of a nation. Leviticus, the laws of a nation. And uh, one of the things that I have noticed in so many, so many churches is that some churches like to pick and choose what laws they follow and which laws they don't. Some churches allow homosexual marriage, which is a sin, and uh, I call these salad bar Christians. They pick what they want. They don't take it all. The book of Numbers is about the wilderness wanderings. Uh, when the Jews came out of Egypt, out of captivity, they wandered in the desert for 40 years. And then the book of Deuteronomy is the uh, laws reviewed um, for uh, Joshua and uh, before they went in to take Canaan, the promised land, which is now Israel. Here's a little a little tidbit. There's a, a some of the Jewish scholars have come up with what they call Bible code, and it's where they look for hidden messages in in the in the Bible, and they use uh, different techniques of uh, taking uh, every seventh letter or every forty ninth letter, and see what messages they can discern 
from the Hebrew Bible. And um, they did this to the first five books. Uh, and they used what's called an equidistant letter coding system. Hebrew is written uh, right to left. And uh, they found hidden in the book of Genesis and Exodus the word Torah. And then in the book of uh, Leviticus, they found hidden in using that technique the word Yahweh, which is Hebrew uh, word for God. And then in the, uh, the last two books, they found Torah spelled backwards. So the first two books and the last two books of the Torah point to Yahweh, God. So I'm going to try to show you that there's proof in the Bible prophecy that is occurring today that uh, will show you that this is all real. It's not, you know, some fantasy. So there's about uh, 1,239 prophecies in the Old Testament. Um, people refer to Bible prophecy as eschatology, the study of, of prophecy. And there's about 578 prophecies in the New Testament. You know, Jesus said in John 14, 29, he says, I've told you these things before they happen, so when they happen, you will believe. In Revelation 1, 3, he says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, meaning the book of Revelation, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written and because the time is near. So my comment here is that God would not have put prophecy in the Bible had he not wanted us to understand the season in which we live and understanding the signs of the rapture and Jesus' second coming. So we'll start with the book of Genesis. Um, this is the first prophecy in the Bible. It's called the Proto-Evangelum. This is God speaking in the Garden of Eden when he found that Adam and Eve had sinned and Satan had come into the garden and introduced sin to the world. God says, I will put enmity between you, meaning Satan, and the woman, and between your offspring, meaning Satan's offspring, and hers, hers being Mary and the offspring being Jesus Christ. And he says that uh, he... He's talking about Jesus will crush your head, Satan's, and and you will strike his heel. Now, that's that's one interpretation of this. Uh, the King James Version uh, is worded, obviously, a little differently, uh, but it, it has the same meaning. And um, this is where the cosmic chess match begins between Satan and God. Satan is always, uh, God is always steps ahead of Satan. And I'm going to show you a few examples of these move counter moves that have occurred over time between the two of them. Someone once said, why, why did God allow Satan to exist and roam the earth and create all this havoc that we live in today? And I heard a good answer, and I think it's probably right. And that is that God is obviously showing all the angels who's in charge. But more importantly, he's using Satan to glorify himself and to show us that he, he is the true supreme being over everything. And um, I think it also allows him to test us to find out who we want to follow, which direction we're going to take, because we're operating with free will. And, um, you know, being a Christian and living in this sinful world really proves to God that, you know, we love and and I want to follow him and not Satan. So here's some of those moves. Satan attempts to spoil God's plan by introducing sin to man and woman. And then he goes on and tries to corrupt the DNA, the seed of man, with, by, you know, with the fallen angels, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, he tries to destroy Moses, the deliverer, to prevent the occupation of Canaan. He knows that, uh, that God is going to choose Moses to free the Jews from captivity of 400 years in Egypt and take them back to the promised land of Canaan. So what, is, what does Satan do? He populates Canaan with giants over the 400 years while the Jews are captive in Egypt. And that's documented in Numbers 13, 28 through 33 in the Bible. And then Satan tries to destroy Christ at birth through King Herod ordering the death of Hebrew newborns. 
And then Satan builds a counterfeit religion called Islam and builds his temple on the location of God's temple in God's city, Jerusalem. And then Hitler tries to wipe out all the Jews on the planet so they cannot return to Israel after World War II because Satan knows that's God's plan, is to regather the Jews back to their homeland and form the country of Israel prior to Christ's coming the second time. So Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. So now let's look at Genesis 5. Um, this, these are the, the first um, people that, that God uh, created uh, in the Bible. And he gives us this genealogy for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons he tells is how long these people were living before the flood. They were living as long as, you know, 950 years, 962 years. After the flood, longevity was reduced to 120 years. And um, Noah was 600 years old at the time of the flood. Um, from Adam uh, until the flood was 1,656 years. And you can add this up by the genealogy in the Bible. And it's estimated that there was a population on earth between 1 billion and 5 billion people at the time of the Great Flood. Now, there's a very interesting gentle character in here, and his name is Enoch. Enoch uh, lived for 365 years. And after 65 years, he was taken by God and walked with God. And God revealed to Enoch what happened at the beginning when uh, Satan and the angels were kicked out of heaven, a third of the angels were kicked out of heaven. And he also gives e Enoch information about the end of the church age and what will occur. He gives him prophecy. Enoch wrote a book about it. And um, part of that book was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The entire book resides in the Ethiopian Orthodox Bible. And Enoch is referred to in the Bible in several places, in the book of Hebrews, the book of Jude, the book of Luke. Um, Hebrews 11.5 says, By faith Enoch was translated, meaning taken up, uh, that he should not see death and, he, and was not found because God had translated him. Before, for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Jude 1.14 says, Enoch also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these sayings, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. He's describing the return of Jesus Christ a second time, riding with his army of the saints to put Satan and his minions into the abyss, into hell forever. In Luke 3.37, uh, it says that... Um, which was this, he describes the, line, the the genealogy that's in the book of uh, of Genesis. So these later uh, prophets knew about Enoch and quoted Enoch. So let me show you a little another little mystery. Uh, this is the definition of names and Strong's definition, I believe it is, uh, what these names mean in uh, in Hebrew. So Adam was means man. Seth means appointed. Enosh means mortal. Kenan means sorrow. Mahalalel means the blessed God. Jared means shall come down. Enoch means teaching. Methuselah means his death shall bring or sent. Lamech means despairing. And the name Noah means comfort and rest. So if you put those together in a sentence, it says, Man is appointed mortal with sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing comfort and rest. That's a pretty interesting little mystery that's coded in the Bible. It goes on to say that Enoch's son, Methuselah, <clears throat> in Hebrew, meth means death, salah means sent, you put that in a sentence, it says, His death, Methuselah, shall bring 
the flood, and he died exactly one week before Noah's flood occurred. Just another little mystery. <clears throat> now, Isaiah 29 wrote this, and this is really profound. It says, You will speak from the ground. Your speech will mumble from the dust. Your voice will come ghost-like from the earth. Out of the dust, your speech will whisper. Many antiquities are being uncovered today. And the Book of Enoch was found in 1947, a partial uh, book, and the book of Isaiah, the complete book of Isaiah was found. And the Testament of the Patriarchs, these are the uh, 12 leaders of the 12 tribes of, of Israel, sons of Jacob. For the 12 Patriarchs, uh, their testaments were uncovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls in the caves of Qumran near the Dead Sea, which is en route to Masada from Jerusalem. And they were left by Jewish scribes known as the Essenes around uh, 150 B.C. to 70 A.D. These are the second oldest manuscripts of the Bible to date. <clears throat> However, recently, while excavating in the city of David, which sits just south of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 6, verse 24 through 26 dating back to the 7th century B.C. was uncovered. And that particular scroll uh, was inscribed with saying, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. So here's, here's the mystery of what happened when the fallen angels um, were kicked out of heaven. Uh, the angels had free will. There was a rebellion led by Satan or Lucifer. And uh, God cast one third of these angels out of heaven. And in the book of Genesis in the Bible, in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, it tells us what happened. It says, when human beings began to increase in number on the earth and the daughters were born to them, the sons, the fallen angels of God, saw the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married many of them they chose. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. When the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were heroes of old men of renown. So what it's basically saying is that uh, they were cast out of heaven, the fallen angels. They found the human women beautiful and they mated with them and their offsprings were giants um, and they were men of old and renown. So God saw what was happening uh, on earth, all the sin that was occurring prior to the flood and he said it was corrupt and all flesh had, had corrupted his, uh, his way upon the earth and God said unto Noah the end of all flesh has come before me for the, the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And he does. He uh, floods the earth. We see signs of that today on top of the mountains, these uh, fossils uh, of sea, sea uh, life, marine life, on the tops of um, the Alps in uh, Switzerland, in the uh, top of the Rockies. There's all types of uh, signs of a great flood that occurred on earth. There's a wonderful documentary that came out in 2017 called Is Genesis History? It's done by some of the most mo notable uh, PhDs in each of their fields in uh, geology and archaeology, anthropology, uh, genetics. And I highly recommend that you, you rent that and watch it. You can see it on... Um, Apple TV or um, I think on uh, some of the others like Roku and um, Google's uh, uh, stick, Fire Stick or whatever they call it. So now we don't have a lot of information about what was happening during the 1656 years and the giants uh, corrupting and the, and the fallen angels corrupting the flesh of humans and animals. 
prior to the, the flood. And uh, the book of Enoch is the key that's been missing. Um, the Nicene Council took the book of Enoch out of the Bible around uh, 200 uh, AD, but they did not take it out of the Ethiopian Orthodox Bible. And the book of Enoch gives us an insight into what was happening during this time. Enoch 7 and 8 says, 200 angels, the watchers they were called, fell from heaven onto Mount Hermon. That's that 9,000 foot peak in northern Israel. And then in, in Jude it says, in the Bible it says, and the angels which uh, kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. <clears throat> so God later put these uh, fallen angels, once he had seen what they had done, in chains in darkness until the final judgment day at the, at the end of the book of Revelation. Enoch says that they mated with the daughters of men and their offsprings were, were giants of the size of 3,000 L's. An L is equivalent to a Hebrew cubit, which is about 17.6 inches. So these pre-flood giants were as tall as 40 to 45 feet. These giants consumed all food, and when men no longer sustained them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind, so they became cannibalistic. They also began to sin against the birds and the bees, the beasts and reptiles and the fish, and to devour one another's flesh and drank the blood. The watchers taught them sorcery, taught human sorcery, enchantments, how to resolve enchantments, astrology, constellations, courses of the moon, war of weaponry, metallurgy, plants, cutting of roots, making of jewelry, and beautifying women with makeup of various colors. Enoch 9, 9 and 15 says that the Lord said to Gabriel, Proceed against the bastards, the reprobates, against the children of fornications, destroy the children of fornications, and the children of the watchers from amongst them. Cause them to go against one another, that they may destroy each other in battle, for they will not have long life. Grant no request that their fathers may make to you on their behalf of their children. This I entitled Clash of the Titans. So Greek mythology may, may be more truth in Greek mythology than, than we realize. He, he goes on to say in the book of Enoch, my judgment for the giants is that they are born from flesh. They will be called evil spirits and will re remain on the earth because they were created from above, from the holy watchers at death. Their spirits will come forth from their bodies and dwell on the earth. The evil spirits of the giants will be like clouds. They will afflict, corrupt, tempt, battle, work destruction on the earth, and do evil. They will not eat or drink, but be invisible. They will rise up against the children of men and against women because they have proceeded from, from time. So these fallen, these fallen uh, uh, these giants, they had spirits, and these are the spirits that in the book of Enoch, that God says will roam the earth until the end of judgment. These are the spirits that we believe Jesus was casting out, the demons he was casting out when he was here on his first visit. In the book of Matthew 12, says uh, Jesus said, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. So the Catholics at every Mass always recite the Nicene Creed. And part of that says, we believe in all things seen and unseen. So <clears throat> if sometimes we see people committing heinous acts, and I question, are they, are they possessed? 
by an evil spirit that's roaming the earth today. So there's lots of uh, examples of things we cannot explain on this earth. It's called antediluvian architecture. Antediluvian anti means uh, pre-flood. And this architecture exists all over the earth. In Machu Picchu, Peru, uh, Cusco, Peru, Nazca lines in Peru, Sardinia, Italy, Cyclopean architecture, and giant skeletons. The machine caves under Malta, the pyramids of Egypt, pyramids of Romania, sub-ocean architecture off Japan and Florida. Um, and if you look in the 19th and 20th century newspaper accounts, there are many, many accounts of finds of giant skeletons. These are post-flood skeletons that have been found. Um, and here's some of the architecture that's left behind. This architecture in the lower portion is in Japan. These are monolithic, giant, cut stones that no one can explain how they got there and who built them. In the upper right-hand corner, you see monolithic, many, many thousand-ton stones with complex polygonal angles that fit together perfectly, that were quarried 40 miles away. This is pre-Bronze Age uh, chisels. Uh, things that were that were uh, produced and we believe this was all fallen angel architecture in the upper left hand corner you see the perfectly machined cuts in this andesite stone which is extremely hard stone to cut here's an example of a megalithic stone wall that's produced uh, these Nazca lines we see in Peru which are miles and miles and miles apart. You can't tell what they are from the earth. You have to have visibility from the air to be able to see these things. And um, there's a great uh, uh, documentary called The Revelation of the Pyramids that was recently uh, produced, and it's one of the best documentaries I've ever seen. And it talks about who built the pyramids and all of this architecture all over the, the earth and how it all lines up uh, with one another. So, the mystery of Noah's descendants and the post-flood giants. Well, we know that there is a second incursion after the flood of the giants. Um, we don't know how that happened. We believe that some uh, polluted DNA by Ham's wife came onto the ark, and um, and and uh, his lineage fathered these post-flood giants, which were not nearly as large, they were more like 13 to 15 to 20 feet tall. And uh, we know that uh, from the genealogy in the Bible that uh, the Canaanites, Jebusites, uh, came from the lineage of Ham. And uh, Ham had fathered the, uh, the great giant Nimrod, which is talked about in the Bible. In Chronicles, 1 Chronicles uh, 11.23, one of the giants was de uh, described as being 10 to 13 feet tall, uh, had six fingers, six toes. Uh, the giants mentioned in the Bible are King Og. We know that his bed was 13 feet long. Nimrod, Amalek. And uh, we know that the tribes of the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Raphaims, these were all giant tribes that were occupying Canaan when Joshua and the Jews came in to drive them out of the land. Here's a, just an example of a picture of David and Goliath. And there's a great YouTube uh, which, which talks about uh, fallen an angels and fallen angel technology. Here's another example of a giant and uh, normal-sized human beings. These are uh, elongated skulls from Paracas, Peru. And uh, they uh, do not have the same sutures in their skulls as a human does. So no one can explain how this came about. And what's even crazier is that uh, there are four or five uh, gentlemen who were on a patrol. Well, let me tell you about the Kandahar giant. This is an, occurred in 2002. <clears throat> they had a giant um, uh, killed... Uh, one entire patrol of the U.S. Army. 
There was a patrol that was wiped out. It didn't report any longer. They were lost. Second patrol was sent out to find the first patrol. And in <clears throat> following their, their, um, their um, path, they came upon remnants of the first patrol, um, radios, uniforms. And um, while they were standing on a ledge below a cave above, this uh, creature appeared out of this cave and uh, attacked the second patrol, killed one of the men in the second patrol, and then they killed this giant, which happened to have six fingers and six toes and red hair. And they were all asked to sign non-disclosure agreements. The pilots of the airplane were asked to sign non-disclosure agreements. And this creature was flown back to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in the United States. It weighed about 1,500 pounds, and it was about 14, 15 feet high, tall. Um, so some proof in the Bible about the post-flood giants is in the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 13, verse 31 through 33. This is where the scouts from the Jews, um, before the Jews came into Canaan, they were with Moses and Joshua, and they sent scouts out to find out what was in the land of Canaan. And they found these giants in the land, and they came back and said, we're like grasshoppers in their eyes, and, you know, they will, they will eat us. So uh, God instructed Joshua to lead the tribe of Israel into the promised land over the Jordan River in the West Bank and wipe out every tribe and all the animals. 31 kings were defeated in the land of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, etc. And God instructed them to kill every man, woman, and child, and beast because he knew they were all polluted with this DNA. And so that's the reason that Joshua and his army did that. So today's great deception. Um, today there are governments and incredible military and commercial pilots eyewitnesses accounts of ufos that are now being made public in the news there's unexplained dna harvesting and surgical experimentation is occurring via cattle mutilation and human abductions by ufos and the bible um, illustrates and tells us many will be deceived by the prince of the power of the air which is satan and personally i can think of no greater deception than to have E.T. show up and tell us, everyone, that they seeded us on this earth to evolve and then return to give us the secrets of the universe and very, very long life. Even many of the elect would be fooled if that happened. So these two great, here's the two views of the Great Deception. The History Channel program, every Friday night airs a program called Ancient Aliens, which offers the secular view that we were put on this earth by E.T., Hollywood and UFO sightings are conditioning the public to believe this secular narrative. Christians' view is that we were, made, we were made of God in His image, as the Bible tells us, and the antediluvian architecture is fallen angel technology, not technology from extraterrestrials. Jesus said in Matthew 24, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So now let me move quickly into some Bible prophecy and talk about the nation of Israel and show you how true the Bible is. <clears throat> the, Israel was birthed by Abraham in an unconditional covenant. He told Abraham, he says, Get out of the country you're living in, unto a land that I shall show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless those that bless thee, and I will curse those who curse thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And so he went forth into Canaan, <clears throat> and he said, Unto thy seed I will give this land. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, Abram he called him Abram at the time, later Abraham, saying, Unto, unto thy seed I have given this land from the river of Egypt, unto the great river of Egypt, unto the great river of Euphrates in Iraq. 
It says, Abraham begat Ishmael, son of Hagar, who was the father of Islam. And Abraham begat Isaac, who was the son of Sarah, who begat Jacob and the 12 tribes of Israel. <clears throat> this is a uh, recently uncovered entrance to the to the uh, city of what we call Dan, and it's 4,000 years old, and the gate of Abraham is found there. This is the northernmost part of Israel. So some key times for Israel in its history was that its first king was Saul, second king was David, who then begat Solomon. <clears throat> Babylon conquered Israel um, and destroyed the first temple because Israel had turned away from God, and God was punishing Israel for 490 years of apostasy and allowed the Babylonians to take them into captivity for 70 years, where Daniel wrote the book of Daniel in the prophecy of the end of the age. And then they were returned after the Persians defeated the Babylonians and built the second temple, which the Romans destroyed in 70 A.D., and then the Jews were dispersed to the four corners of the earth. And Israel was no more until 1948. <clears throat> this is an interesting mystery about Jerusalem. I learned this when I went to Jerusalem. When you look at the word Jerusalem, you see the words USA in the middle of it. That's very prophetic. It's not in the Bible. But it's just very, very interesting that we appear in the middle of the name of Jerusalem. Another interesting little tidbit that I learned from uh, Chuck Missler was that all languages written that are west of Jerusalem are written left to right, and all languages to the east of Jerusalem are written right to left, both pointing to Jerusalem. That's not in the Bible either, but it is an interesting fact. Uh, David purchased Mount Moriah for 50 shekels of silver, uh, there, he had uh, conquered uh, Jerusalem, and the mountain there, Mount Moriah, was a great place to thresh wheat, to separate the wheat from the chaff, and it had good wind at the top of the mountain, and so that's the reason David wanted it and purchased it for 50 shekels of silver. But God had decided to put his name on that city. And it says in Second Chronicles, But now I have chosen Jerusalem for my name to be there, and I have chosen David to rule my people of Israel. So if you look at the Hebrew alphabet, there's a letter in the Hebrew alphabet called the Shin, or they pronounce it Sheen. Um, and it looks like a W. And it's the symbol in Hebrew for God or Yahweh. So if you overlay that letter, over Jerusalem, you'll see that it matches the three valleys that define the city perfectly. The Kidron Valley, the Hinnom Valley, and the Tyropian Valley. So God truly did put his mark on that city. He goes on to say that I have chosen and concentrated, consecrated this temple so that my name will be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. In 1 Kings, it says, Jerusalem, the city where I will put my name. So there's a really great YouTube video on this, and it shows you how the Shin or Sheen overlies those three valleys making up that letter and the city of Jerusalem. Here are some prophecies about Jerusalem that were in the Old Testament in the book of Zechariah. And then in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, it says, In that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth will be gathered together against it. This is the most contested piece of real estate in the world today, has been and always will be. And it was prophesied in the Old Testament in Zechariah 12.3. 12, goes on to say in Zechariah 12, 6, Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. 
Zechariah 12.9 says, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all those nations that come against Jerusalem. When Israel was reformed as a nation in 1948, all the Arab armies surrounding it were better equipped with planes, tanks, and troops. And all came against Israel and all were defeated. And that has reoccurred every time other nations have come against Israel. And this gets back to the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 12, where he told Abraham, I will curse those who curse thee, I will bless those who bless thee. And then in the book of Revelation, it says, And John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That would be Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Here are some prophecies of modern-day Israel that are in the Old Testament. Israel will re be reestablished as a nation, and that happened in 1948. The nation of Israel would be born in a day, Isaiah 66. <clears throat> and it was in one day in the United Nations. He says, I will bring my people back from exile. And God has done that and is still doing it today. It says that the ships of Tarshish will be the first to bring the Jewish people home. Tarshish was where Britain is today. These are the British. <clears throat> Israel will be restored as a monarchy and will not be restored as a monarchy. And today it's not no longer ruled by a king, but they have the Knesset and they are a democracy. It says that the uh, Hebrew language will be revived in Israel. This was uh, prophesied by Jeremiah and it has been. Jerusalem will be divided and it is. And the shekel will be uh, revived as the Israeli currency. This was prophesied in Ezekiel. <clears throat> and then in Isaiah, he prophesied that the wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them and the desert shall rejoice and bloom as a rose. Uh, Mark Twain went to Israel in about 18, gosh, I want to say 1880. <clears throat> and he said, why would anybody ever want to live here? It's a desert. It's desolate. There's nothing here. Um, and when the Jews came back, they um, started irrigating the land um, from desalinization plants. And today, it ships a huge amount of food into Europe from Israel. They're the third largest exporter of cut flowers in the world. And it's no longer a wasteland. These things have all happened and they were forecast, prophesied in the Old Testament. This is another prophecy from Isaiah 49. And if you see the, the uh, picture of Israel, that yellow narrow strip there where Tel Aviv is and up is uh, six to seven miles wide prior to them taking the West Bank and Golan Heights in the 67 war. And this was prophesied. It says, though you were ruined and made desolate, in your land laid waste. Now you will be too small for your people, and those who devoured you will be far away. The children born during your bereavement will yet say in your hearing, this place is too small for us. Give us more space to live in. Now there's prophecies about the Messiah's first coming. There's actually 122 of these prophecies. I only picked out a few. And um, these were all prophesied in the Old Testament that the only begotten Son of God will be called the Messiah. The Messiah will be born of a virgin. He will be born in Bethlehem, six miles, obviously six miles south of Jerusalem. The Messiah will be called out of e Egypt. After he was born, his, his parents took him to Egypt to get out of the reaches of Herod the Great. And they didn't return until Herod the Great died in 4 A.D., uh, it says the Messiah will be a prophet like Moses, a new covenant. The Messiah will start his ministry in Galilee, which he did. The Messiah will enter Jerusalem as a king riding on an ass, which he did. John the Baptist cries out, prepare the, the way of the Lord. This was uh, prophesied in Isaiah 40. The Messiah will be anointed with the Holy Spirit. That, that was prophesied in Isaiah 11. 
Messiah, Messiah will start his ministry in Galilee, which he did. He will appear as an ordinary man, which he did. He will be a stone of stumbling to Israel. And that's true because many Jews still have not accepted him as their Messiah because they did disregard his first coming. Those not believing Jesus' miracles will be condemned. Jesus predicts the disciples would fall away. The Messiah will be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Some prophecy leading to his second coming is that the, the new covenant will be placed on believers' hearts. Animal sacrifices will be abolished. And that was when the second temple uh, was torn down by the Romans in 70 AD. Every building of the Temple Mount will be destroyed, and it, and it was. Jerusalem will be plowed like a field, and it was. The Jews will be dispersed by the Romans, and they were. Some will not see death until they see Jesus in his kingdom. That will be fulfilled in Revelation 1, 9 through 20. Israel will be dispersed into all the nations, which they were until 1948. The land would become a complete desolate, which it was. When the Romans tore down the temple, and they poured salt all over the land around Jerusalem. <clears throat> so nothing would ever grow there again. Israel will, be, will dwell many days without her land, and, the, and that happened for 1,816 years. And then the land of Israel will, will be partitioned by the nations. That was uh, prophesied by Joel, and it was partitioned by the great uh, United Nations in 1948. Israel will be reestablished as a nation. I've already talked about that. The nation of Israel will be born in a day. I said that. Increased understanding of the prophecies will occur. This is in Daniel, the book of Daniel. And today, <clears throat> we are uncovering and learning more and more about the prophecies in the Bible <clears throat> and how close we are. Damascus will be destroyed. This is in Isaiah 17. And if you look at the war that's gone on in Syria and how much of Damascus has been destroyed, this has been prophesied. Christians will be hated for Jewish Jesus' namesake, and that's gone on. It's, it's more rampant now than it ever than it has been. The apostasy of the church will fully form, and then the rapture of the believing church will occur, which has not occurred yet. Now, here are some various raptures that have occurred. Paul was caught up into the third heaven. The uh, church rapture, was is described in first thessalonians 4 philip was caught away by the spirit the book of acts man child caught away in the book of revelation two witnesses caught up in the book of revelation and enoch was taken in the book of hebrews describes that here are some rapture is not a word you find in the bible it's um it's a word uh, that means to be taken away. So some examples of, of this is the appearing, the blessed hope of the appearing, the catching away, the changing, the entering the bridal chamber, the gathering, the manifesting of the sons of God, the rescue, deliverance from the wrath, the rescue and the transformation. Those are all descriptions of the rapture. So how do I enter heaven? I enter heaven by coming to Jesus and confessing my sins and asking him to forgive me, to recognize him as the Son of God and Lord of Lords, to ask him to come live in you, and then you receive salvation for everlasting life when you do that, and that's called being born again, Christian. Benny Hinn described this uh, as assuming that your spirit is a half a glass of water and the Holy Spirit is a half a glass of water. When you mix them together, they can never be separated. And it's easy to do this and it will change your life. You know, God will accept you the way you are, but he will not leave you that way. He wants a relationship with you and to put him first in your life. Randy Clark, uh, I heard this from Randy at a meeting, and I liked it, so I put it in the slides. 
when all you have is the word, you dry up, meaning when all you have is simple scripture, you dry up. And when you have the spirit come in and enter you, you blow up. But when you have the word and the spirit, you grow up. When you have the Holy Spirit in you, you have this insatiable sir, uh, excuse me, thirst to read the word. And the more you read, the more you want to read. And the more you read and the more you pray, the closer you get to God. And it really changes your life. Perry Stone describes <clears throat> the difference between a believer and a disciple of God. He says that a, a believer accepts Christ as Savior. A disciple makes Christ Lord, puts him first in his life before everything else. <clears throat> a believer wants fire protection from hell. A disciple wants rewards in heaven. A believer serves God on their own terms. Well, I'm not going to go to church today. I'm not going to pray today because I want to watch a football game. A disciple serves God on his terms and puts him first. A believer only sees the church. A disciple sees the kingdom. A believer sees church membership. A disciple sees a brotherhood of the blood. No matter what color, race, creed, all Christians. A believer wants a message to tickle their ears when they go to church. A disciple wants a relationship with Jesus Christ. A believer fights the enemy with sermons they've heard. A disciple fights the enemy with the new covenant. And the difference is being born again of the water and the spirit. So my advice is, be a sheep, not a goat. Says, Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate. <clears throat> For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Jesus also said in Revelation 3.10 to the Church of Philadelphia, Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of this earth. So I will now end my presentation. I thank you for listening and wish you all a good day.